Hi, I'm Ryan Gregson. I'm a two-time Olympian, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've had a great week and that you've enjoyed catching up on previous episodes, including last week's guest, Genevieve Lacaz. What a terrific insight into what it takes to perform at Jen's physical best on the world athletic scene, making Olympic finals and uh, on a trajectory to further best performances. Some great insights taken from that. Thanks to everyone that's uh, shot across uh, uh, feedback on social media. And uh, thanks also to the people that are leaving reviews, the listeners of the show, leaving reviews on iTunes. Uh, One came through just this week. Uh, which uh, features as as per Greg or GG1. So thank you, GG1. And GG1 said, great podcast to help inspire and motivate. It's great to hear background stories and training methods from down-to-earth elite athletes. And uh, it's certainly something that uh, I've been appreciating the feedback on that, you know, we see these elite athletes and peak physical performers achieving great things, performing at their best, but uh, sometimes we don't get visibility as to just what it takes, the sacrifices, the challenges, etc. As per Jen's outline last week of her bumpy road with uh, the stress fracture in a talus and how she overcame that, likewise, every athlete, whether we're elite or just seeking to do our very best, uh, we have to navigate the injury journey, at, certainly uh, at some point along the way. Which brings me to episode 31 today, featuring Ryan Gregson. Ryan's a remarkable Australian athlete. He's a two-times Olympian and the Australian record holder for the 1,500 metres on the track. Ryan, this year, uh, was a finalist in the 1,500 metres at Rio, the Rio Olympic Games, where he went on to become the first Australian in 40 years to compete in that event, uh, representing Australia. Uh, his final didn't quite go how he wanted it to, and Ryan outlines what happened in the Olympic final this year. He had some sensational heats. And as you listen, remember that Ryan has beaten almost everyone on the circuit, bar one athlete that he references at the end, the gentleman who actually went on, Matthew Centrovich, to win the 2016 Olympic Games. So Ryan's featured in uh, Diamond League athletics podiums for the 1500 metres over the last several years. And he's overcome some real adversity with his his body. Uh, Ryan talks about his injuries and uh, the years that he had up and down with uh, with stalled momentum around his training. So you're going to really enjoy this episode and get a whole lot out of it. Listen in. There's also a cool little physical challenge that Ryan issues at the end. And so uh, for those that took on Jen's challenge, good on you. I hope uh, I hope your arms have recovered. There's a new one coming today from Jen's boyfriend, Ryan. Gregson, here he is. Let's jump straight in. So, Ryan Gregson, what's one thing that scares you, mate? Oh, it scares me. Um, injury, I'd say. That's, that's a big one. Um, I have, I've been good for the last two years, but from 2010 to 2000, end of 2014, uh, I had a lot of, I think I had about six stress fractures and plenty of tendon injuries as well. So that's something that's always in the back of my mind to, to not get hurt again. So it's definitely something that scares me, but it also makes me, you know, stay on top of my game that I've got to look after myself because I don't want those things to happen again. And uh, Ryan, it's interesting you mentioned injury because uh, the previous episode's guest, who's obviously your girlfriend, Genevieve Lacaz, that was her answer as well. Oh, really? <laughs> you guys haven't been comparing notes? No, no, no. <laughs> So what is it about, you know, the injury that scares you? Is it anything in particular, the fear of not getting back to your best or the fear of losing momentum with your training? It's the momentum because the the best way to get fit is just consistent training over a long period of time. It's not about any one session. It's just about putting year upon year, layer upon layer. And if you're, 
if you have to, you know, take time off, um, oh, you know, a week you can handle, but, you know, what really sets you back is having to have, you know, three months off and it really sets you back. And um, I just don't want that to happen again. Yeah. And uh, and, and we'll go there because you've had, you know, you've had some really mm-hmm. tough seasons and, yeah. you know, broke through with an incredible year this year, 2016. Mm-hmm. And we'll go there as well with the success at Rio and then, you know, the, how the final played out for mm-hmm. you. Um, mate, how did you get started in, in, in your running? Was there a moment when you knew that you were destined for, you know, Olympic Games and you knew there was a real seed of potential? Any particular moment like that? Um, I, was, I always did – I started off with little athletics when I was five and I'd always uh, win the events at my local club, but I certainly wasn't a standout – like maybe when I was ten, I was getting third in a state cross country, but I was never never winning um, winning state events. But I always had this belief, and I think my mum had this belief probably because she was biased. She thought her son was great. You know, I had this belief that you know I'd, I'd always be, you know, I'd always get to the Olympic Games, and I'd probably false hope there for a while. But and, and I, I just stuck with the sport. I played other sports as well, but I always put um my, my main thing was running and. I got to the age of probably 17, 16, 17, I started winning, you know, junior Australian titles and definitely I was on track from, from probably 16, but before then I I always thought I was going to do it. Wow. So you always... Yeah, I don't know. It was, I don't know, I just had self-belief. But. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think anyone that gets to the levels of success, mm. you know, experience and experience in, you know, it isn't a fundamental, mm. uh, you know, performance driver, right? I, I had great parents as well who who you know took me everywhere and gave me every opportunity and and really believed in me as well my dad was probably more realistic uh, but my mum you know she thought that I was gonna be great she just thought her little son was you know the best thing ever so um that also helped because she was a, a big driver and you know getting me to getting me to training and making sure I did all my, my all my training, all my exercises um, outside of training as well. So um, that definitely helped. And um, and mums, you got to love them, right? They're, you know, they, they always see the best for the potential. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, your youth, your, your running, early running years were, you know, marked with some great successes through there. I mean, you, you knocked off one of the previous podcast guests, Craig Mottram's record yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I think in one year. You, it was well 17. You broke a Australian junior 3K record. That was probably about the time where I really... From 16, I won like a, my first Australian age title, and by 17, I was starting to break all the records. So it really happened pretty quickly. By at the start of when I just turned 16, I you know hadn't really even won a state title, but by 17, I was you know breaking the Australian junior record. So it all happened very quickly when I you know went through puberty mm. and had a growth spurt and it just all happened pretty quickly yeah and I, be- I believe uh, Ryan you had some other you know competing interests in your youth you were also quite a talented hockey player with yeah. N-Swiss New South Wales Institute I was actually I was actually in N-Swiss be- for hockey before I was in it for for running um, that was more of the family sport so my cousin is uh, Casey used to be Casey Easton now she's Casey Sabloski so she's been to three Olympic games for, for hockey and that's the main you know uh, sport with my extended family so I kind of got thrown into that at a young age but I think I was at a a junior hockey camp and one of the hockey coaches said oh no one can do the five lap run in under five minutes because it's not 400 meters <laughs> so um he said no one can do it and I said I worked it out they're like 350 meter laps or something like that and I said no nah, I'll do it and he said no nah, no one can do it and I did it in like 455 and he said that kid's gonna be great He's an N-Swiss. So I got into the N-Swiss um, hockey program probably on the back of my running. But I did have a bit of skill too. But, um, yeah, it was always running was my, my main thing. And that coach, Ryan, was he referring to you being great as a runner or great as a hockey player or as great as an athlete? What well, he, was, he probably didn't understand how, you know, I was at a hockey camp. He wouldn't have understood that... Um, he thought I was just mainly going to be serious about hockey. So he's thinking this guy with an engine on a hockey field will run all day. <laughs> brilliant. But I just, you know, I like the camaraderie of a, a team sport and yeah. I enjoyed that. But I, that was, you know, probably when I was 14. I, I, I quit the game altogether by the time I was 16. So, 
um, and just just fully focused on running. On running, was that hard for you to leave one behind? Did you feel like you were missing missing out on anything potentially? No, definitely not. Because you know, some of my closest friends I still have now are the the guys from my hockey days and good group of guys. But at the time when I was sixteen, I think my older sister was uh, seventeen, eighteen, and she did her ACL and uh, playing hockey. Mm. So it was a pretty simple decision and I wasn't going to I saw that happen to her and um, I wasn't going to let that happen to me so it was just too much of a risk yeah wow and have you seen that spoken to that coach since uh, your, your recent successes <laughs> <laughs> nah I <laughs> no nah. Been, it's a, not, a different world well I think they um, it was a got end up being a bit of a strained relationship over the next um, couple of years because the the people from the New South Wales hockey programs because I was like a an under fifteen I was like the state captain for my age and centre half and all that like that and I think they got you know a bit angry that their captain and like one of the main players was had interests elsewhere and things like that so but I left the sport at sixteen and yeah never looked back well uh, you're destined for for a different calling yeah right? definitely wow interesting powerful um, also mountain running. That featured somewhere in there, didn't it? Yeah, that was when I was 16. At 16, I went to the World Mountain Running Championships in, in Turkey. That was a great... The a, World Championships? Yeah, the World Mountain S- Running. Australian Open team? Uh, it was a junior race. Junior, I think it was yeah. under 20. So, yeah. um, so I was 16 at the time. And um, me and my dad, um, we're pretty close. And he just saw somewhere on a website that the World Champions, Championships for Mountain Running was in Turkey. And we just thought... Um, this could be great. We saw the Australian chances was in Canberra and you had to just come top three and you'd be able to go to Turkey. So we did that. I won the Australian title and Dad ended up being the team manager. I don't know. So he, he was the team manager, did the team's itinerary and like he's got no affiliation with athletics or mountain running at all and ended up being the team manager. So he um, we, we did the race in... Um, Bursa, I think the place was called in Turkey, but after that we went to Gallipoli, we saw Troy and spent some time in Istanbul as well, so it ended up being a great trip and yeah, my dad was the yeah the, the team manager of the Australian mountain running team, which was just self-appointed, but he did the, <laughs> he did the, uh, you know, the itineraries for everyone, everyone did a holiday afterwards, and it was just a good trip with uh, me and my dad and about 10 other Ten other runners, and um, it was great. Saw Turkey. Was your family growing up, Ryan, a fairly sporty, active family? Where, like, where have these genes come from? Do you think? Yeah, good genes. Um, my dad was a really good country rugby league player. My mum was a good country hockey player. So you know, they were always um, heavily into sport, and that's why they got me and my um, older sister into sport at such a young age as well. Yeah, cool. So it was always in there. It was yeah. a big part of your growing yeah, up. Yeah, big sporting family, mate. Um, in terms of. Uh, this year, let's fast forward way way fast forward now. Uh, Twenty sixteen uh, breakout year. I mean, the first Australian uh, to uh, final in the fifteen hundred meters at Olympic Games for forty years. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you go into Rio this year? And we'll go back and fill in the gaps with the journey. But uh, how did you, how did you what, what, what were your processing the expectations on yourself? You'd had a bumpy road with lots of injuries and in getting there. Um, how did you handle the pressure in the heats? Because, I mean, in the 1,500 metres, I mean, I remember Nick Willis, a previous mm-hmm. podcast guest here, speaking about the fact that the heats are often where it, you know, it happens. You've got to get across there and then you know, get into the final. Yeah. What was your strategy going into the heats this year in, uh, in Rio? I was really confident because I had had such a good year racing. You know, I got two third places in Diamond League 1500s I had a fifth place a sixth place a seventh place so I was having lots of results um, you know at the pointy end of the field in, in, in the big races against the best guys in the world so I was very confident and it was probably the first time I ever rocked up to a major championship knowing I was ready uh, last year at the world championships you know I rocked up in I was healthy but you know I'd only probably had you know, six months of, of good training behind me. It probably wasn't enough. I ran okay. I didn't, I didn't, didn't end up getting through the heat. It was a tough heat. It was, it was one of the slower heats and um, it didn't didn't um, didn't work my way. But um, I think there were signs at the World Championships last year that, you know, I felt comfortable in that environment um, of a major championship. And ever since probably the World Champs last year, every race that I had since then in the, that previous build-up year to the Olympics was pretty good. I didn't have... You know, one bad race. Every race was good or, or great. So, 
um, that gave me a lot of confidence. I'm not someone who can bluff confidence. I, I get it from you know running well. So when I you know turned up on the start line for the Olympic heat, mm. because I had ran so well for a year, um, I was pretty confident that if I just there was no reason why I would have a bad run because you know I hadn't had a bad run for a year. So yep. um, that's what gave me a lot of confidence that I'd be able to get into the semi final. Yeah, and uh, and Ryan, what was going through your head as the uh, gun was um, in the heat, heat um, relax yep relax uh, you know I just I, I knew I didn't need to do anything outstanding to get through the next round I just needed to stay on my feet be composed and um, then in the last lap move out and um, overtake a few guys and finish only yeah in the top six so to get through it was, it was pretty generous I think it was about maybe 13 guys Just I was thinking I just got to beat half of these guys and I'll get through and I think you came through in the heat second yeah I come second yeah. I had a good really good run Yeah. and the, the the gentleman in front of you was the 2008 gold medalist if yeah keeper up yeah, yeah keeper up so so you knew you were, you know great mission accomplished and yeah. then um, what was the turnaround time before the final uh, two and a half days so we probably raced on uh, a, a Tuesday morning for the heat and the semi was uh, semi, yeah. Thursday night. So the next couple of days, just a lot of recovery, you know, ice bath, massages, plenty of food intake to, you know, um, you know, replace what you lost. And it was also um, pretty hot that morning session. The, the night, the nights in Rio weren't hot. It actually cooled off a bit, but the, the mornings were pretty, were pretty hot. So, you know, I made sure I hydrated and, um, just so when the the semi final came around, I was fully refreshed and good to go. Yeah, and I mean, Ryan, people often ask me, you know, get inside the actual specifics of uh, you know of what you know athletes like yourselves are doing. What what was your you know, your routine like for the ice baths? Okay, um, so pretty much when I, I I raced the heat, got off the track, did an interview went um, to my bag and I already had protein in my bag so I made sure I got like 50 grams of protein in straight away and um, so plenty of Endura um, protein bars and drinks in straight away and so I got that in and then I went straight away for a 20 minute jog um, nice and easy just to kind of work out the kinks then straight into a uh, quickly stretched my hamstrings and calves because that's something that really I get like doms the next day just because I'm getting a bit old now, and I, I, I pull up sore, so I stretch the hamstrings and the and the calves, and I was straight for a like 45 minute massage, mm. and then went back to the village and had an ice bath straight away. So, and then I had a, a, a bigger meal after that with some more carbs and just a general meal. But the main, oh, I'm huge on yeah, getting protein in yeah straight away. That's the main thing for me. Yeah, and you get that through bars and shake, yeah, shake, yeah, bars predominantly. Yeah, yeah. Endura Pro Body Bar usually. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Good plug for Endura. Awesome. <laughs> um, and made uh, and food. Uh, you said you had a meal that was greater in carbs that, that yeah. night. Uh, can you be specific? What was on the menu? I actually went to the uh, Nike Hospitality. I was on a golf course in Rio and actually had a burger. So <laughs> it was just, a, you know, it was a, a, Nike a reasonably burger. reasonably clean burger. <laughs> but um, yeah, I went out to see the to see the um, the Nike team, and they had a great hospitality. And yeah. just to relax, I met up with my family and cool. just had a nice afternoon um, out at the Nike hospitality. And it was just a good afternoon where I could just yeah relax. My coach was there, family caught up with them, and enjoyed the rest of the day until j- just so. Then the next day, which was the day before my semi, I just stayed in the village and relaxed and switched off. And then it would be game day again for the semi. Yeah, cool. And semi, how'd that play out for you? Yeah, same as the heat. I knew it was going to be tougher, but really, it, it's not that much tougher. Um, heats and semis, there's, there's not that much different to it. Like, there's always plenty of casualties who get knocked out in the heat. It's just you get to the Olympic Games or the World Championships, and it's there's a lot of good guys. There's about there's 12 guys that make the final, but there's about 30 guys who you could probably see in the final. Yeah, wow. It's just it's really. Other than you know, there's the top few, which are the standouts, the absolute standouts. But other than that, the, the next tier, which I probably you know see myself in, there's a lot of guys who are at a similar level. So you know the heats are cutthroat, the semis are cutthroat. But I just knew I had to have another good run, relax, relax the first couple of laps, and then um, when I got a chance to move through with 700 to go, just move through and um, stay in my feet and run well but the main thing was just relaxing early and not panicking because yeah. I think that's what a lot of people do on the big stage they, 
they they uh, they panic at the the um, the parts of the race which aren't that important. It's the first couple of laps, and they just waste a bit too much energy. So that was to conserve energy early and uh, move forward through at the end of the race. And I mean, that's um, I recall the interviews with you through. I think Pat Welsh might have been on the mic or yeah. someone there, and um, and you were talking along those lines. I was just trying to hold myself back and just relax and, mm-hmm. and you know pick my moment. So you got through on the semi, and that's a huge occasion for Australian athletics. First, you know, fifteen hundred meter runner through to the final for forty yep. years, mate. Awesome. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was the gentleman that was the last to make that? I think a Graham. Is that right? Graham Crouching, yeah, seventy six. And he was there watching the final. Is that right? Oh uh, yeah, I'm, don't know. I don't know. Don't yeah. know. Um, so assuming he was. Yeah, um, he will say great, that. Great yeah. moment for Graham. Yeah. Um, so uh, talk us through the final. Yeah. So that's the you know with how much i probably relaxed at the start of the race in the final that probably hurt me because you know the heat was one in 339 the semi was one in 339 but this you know the final was one in 350 so it was a completely different kettle of fish like even 339 with the caliber of athletes um, on the world stage that is a relatively slower race 350 is just a complete dawdle so where i probably I'm used to just relaxing and switching off so much the first couple of laps. I, I did that, you know, when it is that slow, pretty much if you are not in the top few at the bell, it's um, we can all pretty much run as fast as each other in the last lap and it just makes it tough. So, yeah, flat, we can all run. If you put us, if you sent us all down to the track now and got us to do a 400, we could all run 48, 49 seconds out of blocks. So, mm-hmm. You know, when we've done a couple of laps um, and, and a little bit tired, we can probably all run about 50, and we pretty much all did. It's just um, whoever had the positioning right at the bell, you pretty much finished that way. And, you know, if the race was, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds faster, it really doesn't matter where you are at the bell because the guys who who are further up the field have generally worked a bit harder to get there, you know, have been um, used more energy jostling for position and holding their spot and, like usually see someone like Willis who comes from the back because he's switched off for 1100 metres not worrying about where he is and he tries to get there at the right spot and I, I guess that that technique is out the window when it's that slow because mm. it's literally just a 400 metre race mm. and um, that's what it was and I was, I was in a good spot for the first uh, about the first 700 metres and there was a, I think Kiprop pushed um, Quimoy over and mm. Quimoy went down and that I actually nearly went down too I think I you know, put one foot mm. on the inside and, and and nearly went down and luckily I stayed on my feet but in doing that I got shuffled all the way back and um, I took 100 metres to regather, compose you're right, you're okay, you're still on your feet and I think it got, got to about 650 to go and I saw a gap open up on the inside and I thought, you know run less distance, take that gap, but uh, it ended up going nowhere and I got shuffled back again. And by, by that stage, it was 450 go. I was at the back on the inside and there was just nowhere to go. And look, I, I ran well in the last lap, but I was just, you know, I had to do too much work. So it's hard when the race is that slow at the start and it comes down to literally a 400 meter sprint, any mistake, mm. you're gone. Yeah. And um, you know, the guys who got the medals didn't make a mistake and un- unfortunately... I did. Well, uh, I mean, the Sydney Morning Herald was just, you know, preparing for this you know, recently there. I think they, they summed it up. Ryan Gregson finished his race and immediately wanted to run it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, maybe not immediately, but at least give, have another crack at it. Um, they didn't use the word crack. That was my uh, <laughs> insertion. Gregson was perfectly placed, but then made a tactical error and whoosh, the moment was gone. The race was as good as over. He went from place well to struggling for the place at the end, he finished ninth in 3:51. So, yeah. I mean, I watched the interview, and it, 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 it was obviously evident that you know you were disappointed. Was it just purely in that one tactical moment? There, there wasn't much I could or, do with um, you know, with nearly falling over. That was you know, that was just a bit of bad luck. But you know, I stayed on my feet. But from then, with about 650 to go, I saw a, you know a gap on the inside open up, and I thought instinct was you know it's. As a place to move up, you run shortest distance on the rail, move forward where it was a bit of a risk because, you know, it might not open up as well and someone might might move in and close that gap. So what I should have done there was 6.50, you just move out to lane two and just ran wide and got to close to the lead by, by the bell. But 
you know, that was a really hard lesson. But I, I've never been, um, unfortunately, I've never been in a race like that before in my life. I, every race uh, at the major championships was at least seven or eight seconds faster, where even if you are two or three metres, four metres back at the bell, you can, you can make it up because, like I said earlier, the guys who, who had worked hard to get in the good positions are usually a little bit more tired than someone who's just hung back and relaxed the whole time. But when we are running 73-second laps, mm. yeah. everyone's fresh. So it yeah. was, you know, but I think it was obviously, you know, I did make a mistake um, in the race, and but you know it was obviously a lesson that I needed to needed to learn because I wasn't as prepared for it as as I would have liked, and um, I'll never make that mistake again. Yeah, all learning, right? Yeah, and good days ahead for you. Yeah. Um, it's a moment made in your career um, uh, where you were at a crossroads in terms of you know injuries and potentially feeling like that was the end for you. Has it been a moment like that where you really doubted that whether you could get get back on track? Never, never a moment like that. Never, and I don't know. That's 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 a probably a huge reason why I was able to get back. Um, I just never. I don't know. Maybe it's that self belief that I had as a little kid. I just couldn't envision that it would never, yeah, not work out. So, yeah. to to give listeners some context, can you just give us the sort of period of injuries that you went through? What did how did that play out? Um, yeah, I've, 2010. In July, I I was 20, around 331 flat for 1500, broke the Australian 1500 meter record, and pretty much the next day I woke up with a pain in my foot, in the navicular bone, and I ended up having to have six months of no running. It was a really bad, it was a really bad injury, and that really set me back. And it was that was a month before the Commonwealth Games in Delhi that year, and I was one of the favourites to to get a medal and. So that, that was a hard pill to swallow, having to watch that on crutches from back home when, you know, um, just a month earlier, I was, I was one of the favourites to get a medal. That, that was a really hard pill to swallow, but because I had six months off, it just meant my body got so weak, um, my tendons got, got stiff, and when you, when you have time off, you're more susceptible to get something else. So that's I, I've been healthy for two years now because I somehow, thankfully finally started making some good decisions and um, was able to build some momentum and it's actually for me right now it's easy to stay healthy again I know what I've got to do I know what rehab things I have to do and um, but it was just really hard to break that cycle of you know I'd have a couple of months off be good for a few months um, then something else would happen and it was like I just my house didn't have Foundation and it would just fall over when I did too much work because I just didn't have the that base strength because I was always out from something and I had I think two navicular stress fractures, a femur stress fracture, a fibula stress fracture, sacrum stress fracture. I think that's about five there, and um, you know bad Achilles, bad patella tendon, hamstring tendon. Um, I was tearing calves in races just when. I'd have it like in the London Olympics in 2012 in the in the heat. So I made the semi final, but in the heat, uh, after 100 meters, I got a push in the back and stumbled and nearly went down. I, I stayed up, but I tore my soleus and my gastroc after 100 meters in the heat. So my body was just it was just weak because you know I hadn't had that um, th- that amount of consistent training over the years, but. Now, thankfully, since about November, I've actually written it down on my phone. November twenty fourth, two thousand fourteen, I've been um, pretty out of um, a full bill of health since then, and um, I feel great. Fantastic! So we're coming up to two years of a full, yeah, full exactly. bill of health. Yeah, the whole time through those multiple bone injuries mm-hmm. and tendon injuries and soft tissue injuries, your belief didn't waver. How did you then reconcile the frustration of knowing that there was so much more to get out, but feeling like you were taking a step forward step back step forward. yeah it was hard um, what were your strategies I just uh, I just always had this self belief that there was I was going to have have my day in the sun again and, and maybe it just happened because in 2010 around 331 I think I was the ranked 5th in the world that year so I had a taste of what it was like at the top and I just knew that how good that felt and I wasn't going to stop until I had that again so maybe if you know 2010 I didn't have a great year and all I knew from the sport was 
that I was having these terrible injuries and that was my only experience. Maybe, yeah, I would have given up and think, thought this is bad. I don't like this. It's just all bad. But because I had that taste of um, running 3.31 in Monaco and how great that felt, I just knew that I wasn't going to stop until I had that back. And um, and that was just that the, was the driver. Yeah, that, that was, was the driver. driver. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I ran that time at 20, when I was having these injuries, I was 21, 22, 23, 24. So I still, I, w- I was still young, you know, I was finishing my uni degree and, you know, I had, I still felt like I had, had plenty of time to, to achieve my dreams. And I'm, you know, I'm 26 now and obviously that's half the career done, but I just, I just knew that once I finally got healthy, I could have a good five, six years of, of achievement if I was able to stay healthy yeah. finally. Yeah, great. And now you're in that patch. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. beautiful. Yep. Um, you mentioned uni degree. Um, what was the uni degree? Huh? I'm still going. It's going to be the longest marketing <laughs> degree in, in history. So I do it through Open Universities Australia online. So uh, it's taking a long time. I started in, went to uni in uh, 2008 when I was, yeah, I was 17, went there for like a year and a half. But when I started to travel, um, it just got a, bit, got a bit hard to do exams and all that. So I took a four-year hiatus and then um i was actually having a terrible year in 2013 i wasn't not only was i struggling with injuries as well i got bloody chronic fatigue as well from working too hard and i got i was a bit sick and then i trained too hard through that it was just a bad period and i um when people would say oh what do you do i just got sick of saying i'm a runner mm-hmm. because running was going so bad so i went back to uni so at least i could say I'm a student, <laughs> uh, and I think it just took a took a bit of pressure off as well. That you know, even if I, I was having injury or running wasn't going as good as I liked, um, at least I felt like I was still moving forwards in life with um, you know my degree. In, I mean, uh, in interviewing <clears throat> Genevieve uh, earlier, Genevieve or Jen mentioned that you know there's sacrifices that you make. You know, at the level of you know activity that you're doing, um, study you know stable home mm-hmm. whole lot of things um how do you process that you know when you see uh obviously you know it's all about sacrifice but is there ever moments in those down lows where you're right in the, the roller coaster at the moment it's a great roller coaster mm-hmm. you know great uh, upward trajectory for you Ryan but um is there any moments where you sometimes go oh geez this is a, you know do you wish that the times that your life was different or it's like no this is all in there's nothing else I'm engineered for I'd no sacrifice for me. Yeah, I love it. Wow, that's I awesome. wouldn't do anything else. I, I'm 26 now, and I think um, two more Olympic cycles, cycles, I'll be 34. But I just wish I could do this for the rest of my life. Mm. I, I love it. I love, I love the travel. I love working towards a goal. I love the feeling of winning a race. Is is nothing mm. better. It's, I love it. And um, I think because I missed, um. That four and a half years where I was still doing the sport, I was still making the major championships every year, but I knew I still missed out on on achieving because I was only able to put like half half the training in, and it just made me it makes me look so forward to the end of my career. We can actually go back to all these races that I performed badly at or the championships that I ran badly at, and just go there again, but perform well, and that yeah. just excites me and. Um, gave me extra incentive to achieve because you know there's plenty of um plenty of meets around the world that you know i haven't performed as as well as i'd like to so that's why i just want to do it for as well as long as i can so i can just have lots and lots of good races do you think that injury period has given you a perspective that you wouldn't have otherwise had definitely yeah, yeah. so i and it's also made me learn so much about my body you know what i Maybe I can't handle running 160 kilometers a week. Maybe 120 to 140 is more me. You know, I learnt so much about isometric strength with my um, tendon injuries, and I do them almost daily just to um, keep my tendons alive. And the the, the hard lessons I did learn um, from being hurt, I, I truly believe that is that's what's going to give me a, a career like Nick Willis, someone who's running well when they're 33 and I think Nick said he's going to go for another bloody four years so he'll be 37 so um, I think um, what what I had to 
those apprenticeship years where I had to learn the hard way, I really do think that's going to give me um, um, increase my longevity in the sport. And if you had to summarise from the apprenticeship, served your apprenticeship, the one takeaway, uh, what would it be? The one takeaway for for you, if you could sum it down to one bit of advice that you know you would give yourself yeah. now if you went back to that. 20, it's it's hard because 20. I got so. It's hindsight's great. Mm. What I would say is when I was at a position when I had a niggle or had an injury, I look back and I think at at the time I tried to make the best decision I could, just take myself and my injuries more, more seriously. Like if it's a situation where, you know, you've got, you've got a sore, sore tendon and go see, go get the best advice, get more scans and just treat yourself like a, an absolute professional and just think what the best guys in the world would be doing. They'd, um, try to get things as sorted as, as quick as possibly and that, that's what I you know I've been pretty healthy now but Genevieve has a couple of niggles now and what I'll tell her is you know when she's got a sore tendon just do everything you can possibly do mm. to speed things up as quick as possibly like every day or few days you have dilly dallying or doing the wrong thing it's just it's just time where you're not going forward so mm. that's what I would have told myself just just make more professional decisions to get yourself yeah, back on the park as quick as possible. Yeah. Is there an example, Ryan, where you didn't make the decision that you would... Yeah, I th- the main one is with my um, patella tendon. That's, you know, it's still a bit grumbly now, but I'm on top of it. But I just wasn't as urgent enough to get it fixed. I didn't know enough about uh, tendons. I thought they were more like muscles, you know, so I'm probably just getting... Um, you know, massage, taping, all these different things to, to fix it instead of real hardcore strength mm-hmm. um, to fix it. And it was just time wasted. And that led to, you know, because I was compensating with my knee, that led to a sacrum stress fracture and things like that. So just getting onto things straight away is what it would have told. Essentially, yeah. getting onto things straight away. If your Achilles is a bit sore that morning, that afternoon, Get on. Strengthen up. Don't don't wait a couple of days and oh yeah, a couple of days I'll put some strength in it or a couple of days I'll see the physio straight away. Mm. Stop on the spot and sort it out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, certainly from sitting yeah. what I've been doing for ten years, that's, that's exactly wisdom. That, yeah. Wisdom, Ryan. Yeah. Mate, uh, you mentioned you still do your tendon exercises almost daily. What specifically do you do? Um my knee's the main one. Um yeah, patella tendon. It was pretty bad. It's, I, I still feel it, but it's very manageable. So I do lots of isometric strength with, um, on the leg uh, press and the leg extension. Yep. Um, what percentage loads? Oh, uh, lift single leg loads. So I usually go for five minutes to yeah thirty seconds one leg, um, thirty seconds the other in like a, what angles that? It's like a ninety degree angle then I do more like a 130 degree angle so I mix the angles up as well and I'd lift about um, 200 kilos yeah. into the leg so it's pretty heavy and um, as soon as I do it and I, I step off off the machine my knee feels great like, I don't feel it and then um, on the leg extension as well um, mix up the angles as well but 30 second holds for five minutes um, alternating legs and do about 80 kilos on the the leg extension machine, that, that one's a bit harder to lift the um, big amount of weight. Um, Achilles works, so my Achilles was a little bit sore recently, so you know I might do some, some calf raises where I go faster up and then really slow in the eccentric phase down, then I might do 15 of those, and then when I'm at the top, I'm holding a you know 15 kilo weight, and I then go into a 45 second hold, and that isometric strength really, isometric strength really helps it out, and the other main um, tendon injury I have, I, I got them all, the high hamstring tendon. Um, so I, um, I'll i be on a, I have my back. I don't like getting hands on here, um, like that. So I get it there, but I'll put like a 20, 20 kilo weight or a 30 kilo weight like that, and I'll do hold that like that for 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and that really, I can feel it now. That really targets approximately. My, um, yeah, right up there. It really helps in um, 
obviously I'm, I'm aware that um, you know they're never going to be maybe 100 percent and they're gonna they're gonna um, appear every now and then and get, and get a bit get sore every now and then but it's just working out what what makes them worse for instance I tried not to run on soft grass where where I was a kid and I was worried about bone injuries mm. um, I always used to find grass but now if it's an opportunity to run on a road or soft grass I'll always choose the road so obviously I prefer trail and um, that kind of in between surface or good firm grass, but if it's like soft spongy grass, my knee will just blow up because that extra loading cycle. Yeah, it's, a it's loading. shocking. It's really bad for it. And then, you know, we go for a training camp at Mount Laguna in um, California each year, and it's super super hilly. So if I do too much of the hills, my hamstring tendon goes. So things like that, you have to work out what your limits are and. Um, at different phases of the year I have to put more work into strengthening those different tendons but yeah. I've certainly been able to manage the load and balance it pretty well yeah and, and Ryan I mean I, th- I think it's such useful for, for you know it's so useful for people to listen in to hear this that you know even at the, the very pointy end of performance managing obviously oh. body's huge and tendons mate I mean I've mm. seen it in 10 years all sorts of things thrown at them in from a physiotherapy perspective mm-hmm. but just a couple episodes prior to yours, you know, we we uh, featured Peter Maliaris, yeah. uh, tendon researcher out of Melbourne, and we brought him on specifically for, to share a little bit about there's so many misnomers about mm-hmm. how to manage a tendon and some old school ways and yeah. things like isometrics that just, you know, can be really, really effective, obviously, even for people like yourself. Yeah, I've had a lot of, um, yeah, isometric strengths have been great for me. And I was just probably like many people when I was a bit younger, I just used to think, tendon or it's attached to a muscle just mm. rub it and ice it and she'll be right she'll be right <laughs> have some time off but no it, you know you need to strengthen it up yeah they're fascinating things right a bit of a performance round eight questions rapid fire you ready mm-hmm. what's your uh, most disliked training session long run <laughs> yeah wow mm. what is it about the long run i just think i'll never be a marathon runner <laughs> the way my engine is you know i'm good at the 1500 Whenever I get to about 70 minutes, the, so I usually run for 90 minutes, but once I get to 70, I'm, I'm good. I'm good until 70, but the last 20 just feels like forever. That's just, it's just the way my engine is. Like I do a lot of training with Brett Robinson and yeah. we do a long hilly long run and the last, we go to, we're in Fernie Creek in Melbourne and the, the hills at the end, he's just, <laughs> he's just surging up and I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end, but the tr- short track session, you know, I'll kill him. So, <laughs> it's, um, so Brett, if you're listening, yeah. mate, it's training session you most love. Um, threshold runs because you put your heart rate monitor on you've got to stay between a certain zone and if you do them right and you stay in your correct zone they're not that hard because we're not going out aerobic we're staying in a nice aerobic zone for me it's like 165 beats a minute to 170 and when I stay at that um, I run for half an hour and it's not too strenuous cool favourite pre-race meal right Nike burgers um, <laughs> nah Pre-race meal, I'd have the last thing I'd eat would be an Endura performance bar. It's nice and light, plenty of energy, and uh, bananas. Cool. Yeah. Uh, bedtime. Well, now we have got an insight from previous guest Genevieve about your mobile phone use. So there's a. I, I disagree <laughs> with the theory that phone use um, keeps you up. They say with a light it keeps you up, but I if I went to sleep without scrolling my phone, I, I can't fall asleep. So we usually go to, go to bed. We try to get nine hours, and um, so usually sleep by eleven, wake up at eight. Um, so about ten thirty, I just need that twenty thirty minutes, just going through the news of the day. And as soon as I, you know, I've finished <laughs> the, my, my Twitter feed, um, then I put it down. I go straight to sleep. Cool, mate. Cool. Uh, morning time. You just mentioned yeah, eight, eight, o'clock. eight o'clock. And uh, yep, great. Uh, who's the athlete you most admire, and why? I'd say, growing up, I was. Uh, fortunate enough to I was in Wollongong and I did a, um, lots of running with Karen McCann mm. and um, so we used to run together every Sunday and um, Karen was a she was you know coached and managed by Nick Padel as well and she was probably the first person who spoke to Nick about me and it was just um, she was just a great influence she spoke to Nick and said uh, Nick, make sure you get on to Ryan. He's doing too much bloody mountain running. Um, you know, I think he's going to be good on the track. 
so look after him and you know I had some great times with Karen and it was just when I was six, 15, 16 it was just a taste of and that was when Karen you know won the um, Commonwealth Games in Melbourne it was just a taste of what success looked like and how hard you need to work and you know, unfortunately Karen's not with us anymore but it was you know that was my first probably taste of being around a, a really elite athlete and uh, yeah special one special at times yeah uh, who's uh, mate the toughest competitor you've ever raced um, I'd have to say Matt Sensowitz the guy yeah he won the Olympia 1500 I've I think that's the only person I've yeah never beaten I've beaten him in a heat before but nothing um, he's the only person I've I've never beaten I've beaten everybody else um, on the circuit and beaten Willis, Kiprop, McCluffy. That's the thing with the 1500. We're so very similar of abilities. We we all end up usually beating each other, but Centrowitz, he's the only one I haven't beaten. He's just, um, I just see him, he's a total professional. He's such a skilled racer and um, certainly someone I'd love to emulate. And mate on the bucket list, uh, Matt Centrowitz. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Any, any outside of running? What's on your bucket list outside of running? Um, love to be a. I love to work at an AFL club. I think that'd be fun. I saw the Gold Coast Suns boys training this morning at Fizzy Park. I think I. I don't know, I could just restructure their off season training. Yeah. I don't know. It's essentially a distance running sport, a lot of it, and. Hmm. Um, I think I could help the boys out. Oh, mate, so Maybe the it- Sydney Swans, though. They're my. They're my team. So yeah. maybe uh, in transition out of the marketing degree over to something exercise science, <laughs> yeah. sports science. So maybe. All, yeah. of, all the university just gives you an honorary doctorate hanging there for, that'd be, for that'd that. Be handy, yeah. <laughs> Mate, uh, tell me, um, what's one bit of advice you'd give to performers across the board looking to perform at their physical best? It's Yeah, it's not about any one session. It's about a consistent, um, consistent training over a long period of time. I think that's where people... People get it wrong. They, they now one session and just think I'm gonna run great. Where it's not about any any given session. View view it as a training week, as a training month, as a training year. Mm. Um, that's what'll really you'll really see the benefits from. Don't don't just kill any one session, any long run. Just see it see it as a have a very holistic approach. And if you can string a good solid year together, yep. And then you can string two years. You're going to be better after two years than you're after one. And that's what's really going to um, bring you on. And when it comes to racing, I would say relaxation. Yeah. If you're running a 5K, um, you know, you don't... I wouldn't be listening to heavy metal music before you get in the start line and you're all hyped up. I'd be... um, very relaxed and just so you know if it's a 20 minute race you know for the first 15 minutes you you haven't really spent any um any mental energy so when it comes to the the um the important part for the last last bit of the race you're ready to fully fully focus and get the most out of yourself with a with a fresh mind Powerful principles. Thanks for sharing those, Ryan. Um, Mate, I've got to ask because we've got Genevieve's sort side of the story. And just in, in brief, how did that meeting come about? We heard Jen's side of the oh, story. She, yeah. And the relationship. Um, so it was 2007, National Cross Country in Perth. I She did all right. I think I won the under, under 18 race. So I had a bit of confidence and I had um, my mates around me and I had my shirt off as... I don't know why. Is the shirt off? Yeah, the shirt was off. <laughs> Must have been a hot Perth day. And um, I, I knew of her, but I hadn't met her. And uh, I think she she had she knew of me, and I just walked up to her and said, do you like what you see? Um, <laughs> yeah. And it look, it, I can't say it worked initially because it was bloody <laughs> six years of hard work grafting after that. But um, obviously it... Uh, it's that belief. A little, yeah. Belief. I need more of that. Back. <laughs> <laughs> I need. Well, we yeah. got we got the story that you know it was when Genevieve was injured and came over from uh, you know from. Oh yeah, London. that was a bit later. Yeah, but yeah. That was yeah. after your six years. Of that was this. I, I planted the seed. Six years of just yeah, um, consistently and building consistency and. Um, I always she, she was always a good sort. Always showed um, plenty of interest, but um, you know she was in college for five years, and but just um, the stars aligned in 2013, and 
um, yeah, she joined our training group, the Melbourne Truck Club as well. And um, yeah, it's been great ever since. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mate, last one. Um, we like to issue a physical challenge for listeners for oh, the week. Well, it yeah. can be anything that you like, Ryan. You can set the bar incredibly hard. Or you can set the bar at entry level. It can be anything. Mate, uh, what would you issue listeners with in terms of a, uh, a physical challenge for the week? Something that I've really benefited from has been, I don't know if this really applies, but developing a routine before you run of working on your um, glute strength. Mm. And it's not really much of a, well, it is a bit of a challenge to, to start that routine. And every morning when I wake up, I do 10 minutes of, of um, glute strength, whether that's with a, with a band or... Mm. Um, some balanced proprioception work I'm really trying to strengthen my glute and I think that's really helped overall keeping me um, strong as well and my form as well so I don't collapse through the hips and I think developing that routine um, was definitely a challenge instead of just waking up reading the paper and actually just setting that into my um, weekly structure was um a challenge but now it um becomes second nature and i think it definitely helps my morning that feels i feel naked if i haven't done it i don't feel right so 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 listeners can see the routine can we uh get you a video to quickly show your routine and, and people can emulate the ryan gregson yeah, sure. uh, can we can emulate a band oh, yeah band. we'll grab a band yep so yep. after after we yep. wrap we'll get you up and we'll um and listeners jump over we'll pop it on the show notes and have a look at ryan's hip hip program and uh, and take it on i'll be checking it out and uh and mate um in terms of um you know goals ahead uh we wish you all the very best it's been a breakout year for you and uh you know i just think you know thanks for sharing so openly around some of the, the journey and uh the building blocks are there and you know only the best is to come so so mate um where can we find out more about the ryan gregson journey as it unfolds um first of all thanks for having me but uh you can follow me on instagram and twitter i think it's ryan gregson 25 and um i've got a website as well gregson running but um i'm pretty active on social media and i, I share um plenty of different things that i'm doing as well so um yeah and we'll pop you sh- the handles listeners in the show Appreciate notes that. and uh ryan all the very best thanks for popping in thanks brad so guys there you have it another episode of the physical performance show well i sat there with ryan recording the session and uh just felt like getting up and going and doing some gym work or going for a run session ryan's hip stability program is featured in the show notes so make sure you jump over there have a look at the uh the video i've uploaded of ryan demonstrating his glute workout that you mentioned there obviously hard to uh hard to comprehend unless you actually view it so uh it's a terrific little program and i've actually included that in some of my hip stability work i'm off running at the moment but we returning the new year there um so uh check that out also let uh ryan and myself know if you enjoyed the episode ryan's social handles will all be included in the show notes over at pogo physio Uh, just click through to the blog and uh also guys if you're enjoying the show feel free to jump over to itunes leave a review reviews are incredibly helpful in helping other peak performers who are seeking best performance hear about the show and learn the insights of these great athletes so guys until next week have a great week upcoming for the new week is an episode featuring another australian athletics olympian we're on a bit of a roll here Uh, this is an incredible athlete in fact back on episode 30 genevieve lacars referenced this athlete as her favorite athlete we're talking i'm talking to eloise wellings eloise wellings is an australian athletics competitor who has overcome incredible adversity, 10 stress fractures over 11 years, dual Olympian and dual Olympic Games finalist this year at Rio in the 5,000 metres and 10,000 metres. Jen references that it was a really special moment that she had in the 5,000 metre final with Eloise. So jump back over and listen to that if you haven't yet listened to episode 30 with Jen Lacars and get ready for, for episode 32 where Eloise Wellings will uh, talk, talk us through her significant career and uh, how she's navigated the ups and the downs. So it's going to be a ripper. Have a great week. In the meantime, keep pursuing your physical best. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.